Hi, I'm Zach, I'm Mark, uh, 3L here at Chicago Camp, and uh, my project for the practice this semester was the petition for adult name change, as you can see, in the great state of Nebraska. And uh, pretty often too, together, I'm the author, as I said. I was prepared for legal aid in Nebraska, and Annette Aron down there was very, very helpful in answering my somewhat pedantic questions, explaining to me how they do things um, with AJ Author and their processes as far as getting together, um, making sure that the uh, inter guided interviews comply with the uh, forms and such. Then, as always, uh, uh, the team here was great. Uh, Professor Stout, awesome, working at this for a long time, and which is why it's so easy and completely shocking that I could do this for Chicago, someone in Nebraska, and it'll be the same language. We're talking about the same things. Um, Andrew and Jessica, who put up with me in the office, and Chris was very helpful. So thank you very much to all. Um, and then a shout out to the developers, obviously John Mayer and Callie for making it all happen on, on that side of things. So the justice problem that, with a name change is, is really kind of interesting in that it's one of the most broad thing, um, forms, process, legal processes that um, Nebraska and pretty much any jurisdiction would have and that anyone from the high profile examples, so your celebrities and sports stars who want to change their name, you've got Ocho Cinco and Metal World Peace who want to change their name for various reasons, but when they do that, you obviously hear about the news, but that's to say they have to go through the same process, at least theoretically, that any person will want to do, will go, to, go through. So uh, celebrities and sports stars aside, tons of reasons. You've got people who get married, just want to get their name changed, um, pretty routine, um, but somewhat of an afterthought with all the celebration. You have people, in, for religious or cultural reasons, who may make changes or see certain statuses, you've seen that um, in a lot of name changes. Uh, ethnic identity, other sort of identities where they feel that the background or their name doesn't reflect. It's really all about identity is what a lot of the name changes come down behind, but isn't necessarily reflected. So I'll get to that more of a problem later. Uh, kind of the opposite of a lot of the belonging and stuff is what if you people feel that their current name does not belong, whether it's from a divorce or some other sort of domestic relations issue where their name obviously needs to be changed. Um, fraud um, or other sorts of nefarious intent, which obviously isn't allowed by statute, but that necessarily doesn't stop people from trying. Um, and finally, just again, issues of identity. And all of these reasons come together in a very slow animation, but there's only one <laughs> statute. Um, and it's not particularly, maybe, all right, there's only one statute, and it's not particularly cohesive about all, it doesn't bring all those thousands of reasons, obviously, to the reasons and what's acceptable in those cases. As uh, lawyers, it's, it relies on a reasonableness standard and pretty much just has a few basic things um, that need to be listed. Even, which you can kind of see here, so that they're a bona fide citizen. A lot of questions about what that means. Uh, where they're located, where they're filing the petition, uh, their address, just a couple of very basic things, which doesn't really bring to bear a lot of concerns behind the people um, that, that are trying to pursue those different ends that you saw in the previous slide. Now I say there's only one statute, which is the case, but that doesn't necessarily tell the whole picture because as the courts of uh, Nebraska have held, the statute hasn't been interpreted to actually get rid of common law decisions and, and other things which color what's allowed and what's not allowed. And while we don't necessarily build it into a form, the general approach that the courts take means that there's no real statutory prohibition from doing everything. So that it really comes down to the reasons that someone puts in the form, uh, the way they get the process started, what they say at the hearing, um, is, what's all, you know, is what the determination is going to make, determination, determination, excuse me, is going to be made based on. And that the goal is not so much to recognize any of the personal things that I talked about earlier, despite the petitioner plaintiff actually really feeling strongly about those, but to make sure there's no fraudulent uh, behavior, there's nothing that gets in the way of doing business or avoiding debt or uh, contract obligations or anything of that matter. So that's really the kind of the extent to which um, the courts have clarified, which is, any, which is a little bit, but not a whole lot uh, at a practical day-to-day -day reality. So, uh, as far as you know, the actual concrete justice problems that we see in people that may be using a, get, a guided interview, as I say, it's uh, a broad audience who, you know, everything from celebrities, who uh, obviously they may have a lawyer, but people across the spectrum who, even if they may be able to afford an uh, attorney, think it's a simple process and uh, want to, all the way down to the other side of the spectrum as well. Again, there's unusual names. There's a, that's a, kind of a, a lot of what you hear about in, in the news and such, but that definitely happens. And if we're creating a form 
that just allowed someone to write their name and now they have to type it in. Uh, should we be doing validation on those actual names or should we be more freeform? If we do make a change, how do we make that um, show up correctly? Confidentiality. So some people, like celebrities, make those name changes for big, obvious reasons. Other people may not and may want to change their name silently and keep it on the deal and not have it known except for it has a, the farthest that it must be uh, under the law that, to have that out there. And again, the identity issues which are hard to specifically evaluate but definitely are foremost on the mind of people actually going to be using the solution we're providing. So the solutions we have to these are basically obviously the AJ guided interview which allows it to take it from a paper form uh, to uh, more of a conversation interview based process. We can use uh, some of the features of A to J, include macros um, in certain cases to collect information and avoid repeating it, but also explain specifically here's what you need to have, here's what you don't need to have, and if you're providing this information, what's going to happen with it. And now, the kind of conversely, but I think very useful and related, is that that doesn't necessarily mean that all macros and every feature that A to J can put out there necessarily needs to be used in this form. And that actually came up a lot because we learned about throughout the course of the semester that A2J has a lot of cool functionality and you know being leveraged with some pretty basic programming, it can do things and present questions in a way that may be useful in some long and complicated forms, but in a, in a process such as this, which is based on a simple form, and when it is so based on what's going on in the mind of the individual um, litigant or petitioner, it may not be best always to, to invoke some of those. And I found that a very interesting conversation to discuss uh, with the team and with uh, as we were learning about it and with Legal Aid and Nebraska. So keep it simple is what I try to do. Definitely leverage what we have, but uh, not go overboard. So I'd like to show you some of those things now. Um, I referenced the form, and uh, this is it in all its glory from uh, Supreme Court of Nebraska, one page. Pretty simple, and nothing too difficult. And now, So in designing it, um, we're not writing on a blank slate. Uh, the Legal Aid of Nebraska has a number of uh, ADJs on their publicly available website, which they use both in their and to anyone uh, available over the internet. And because those were made available both through internet and on to the public, I tried to, to use those where appropriate uh, and compatible with what we were kind of learning here, uh, at headquarters if you will, to try to produce something that would be very consistent with what they're doing and uh, also within what we discussed. So, the, kind of their standard welcome scripts, along with our UI explanations. Time, again, it is a pretty quick form. Um, you get to see here kind of one of the concrete implementations of what I was talking about earlier, is that um, name is obviously a required form on a lot of, on pretty much any interview. However, here, we have to treat name almost separate, separately for two reasons. A, they're trying to change their name, so basically you must fill out all name fields. May not apply if they're trying to do something unique with their name, maybe one first name, and to run up the idea of what about if you wanted your name to just be Cher, or Prince, or a symbol. Obviously somewhat weird ones, but definitely something that in theory should be supported if you can type it in. Uh, so we're able to use macros such that uh, it'll combine it down and fit into one place on the form. And also, obviously, if you're going to have a, a new name in mind, you're probably pretty eager to put that new name down. Let me remind you that no, indeed, you need to use your current name to start. So, some qualification questions, making sure that they want to do what they say they want to do. Standard uh, date of birth, which also routes in uh, Alaska. Adults are 19 years of age, which I find interesting. So it does that calculation all behind the scenes. Um, another interesting 
issue we have with is because there is so little statutory language, it helps to take advantage of it. So things such as, are you a bona fide resident? But even after three years old, well, I wasn't quite sure what a bona fide resident is. So again, using more and more to uh, explain that and uh, make sure people are what the right answer. In addition, one of the most confusing things about it also has to do with residency in the county. You have to file the uh, just for name change in the at the district court in the county where you've been a resident for a year. So what if you move from Lincoln to Omaha? You moved counties. It's a very good question, and everyone who heard it on our team and, and Nebraska agreed that that was a great question. The answer, for, answer according to statute that Nebraska is going with is that no, you have to wait until you've been uh, in that county for a year before you can file. Which actually kind of brought me to a pretty interesting wrinkle about Nebraska history, in that all Nebraska counties were designed, and the county map of Nebraska is actually designed such that you could travel from one county to the next by horse in a day. That's, and that, they haven't changed that. That's still the way that it's laid out. And so that clearly for Nebraska, it uh, makes sense to make sure that you are where you say you are and that we can track you down, which also is pretty in, light, in line with the uh, requirements that we wanted for name changes, such that people aren't escaping obligations by changing their name. So we tried to, to keep the requirements of the statutory language in there with some learn more as um, staying true to the statute and the process there. Uh, again, only a form for pro se litigants. So no, not yes. Um, so we do conditionals here. Again, just three, two, but uh, don't necessarily use it for um, state. This was another issue that we kind of came up with, but. Given that there's a residency requirement and that you would have to have an address in the state of Nebraska, we don't provide that state, which was, again, an example of one of those conscious choices that when you see it, you're like, oh, that's, it got left out. But no, it's kind of an omission by design. So. A lot more than you doing. Um, Again, I'm trying to see into the world. And then a reason, you have to put a reason um, so that we can have something to measure against that reasonable standard that uh, the judge will be evaluating both the petition stage and the hearing stage. So um, it can't be arbitrary, is really, again, all. It has to be reasonable, not arbitrary, and not intended to deceive. So obviously, you can't have any day to check that, but uh, long text. And boom. And using uh, Nebraska's traditional exit scripts um, there, uh, to be consistent with the rest of what they're doing on their website. In addition, I don't actually think I showed you which was my omission. Uh, we do the same thing if we kick you out on a decline script, uh, which is quite a bit more significant. They like to, because you are kicking someone out of a potential legal right that they may have, uh, it's a bit wordy, but it definitely makes it clear that if you want to discuss it further with them, that there's definitely three or four avenues that you can take to get a hold of someone. Um, again, that's a short form. I'll show you one that's kind of already done. Look behind the scenes timing. Oh, apparently with the uh, formatting turned on here. Uh, it's, this is magic. But, And that would be generally the petition for name change. Um, the only other thing to note is that, yeah, it puts the actual identifying information um, on a separate page, which is confidential, so that when it's actually filed, the first part becomes public record, the second part in actually being able to track them down, that's not. And that's the adult petition for name change. It's in the graph. Question? <laughs> Sorry, um, when you said that the reason has to be uh, arbitrary, there were like three little requirements or whatever you said, do you actually have that in your interview or no? I didn't think I saw it, but I didn't know if you would. It should be. It, well, oh, okay. It, it probably isn't, but no, it should be. I need to go back and look at it. Good call. Any other questions, comments? <laughs> Things that clearly should be in there. <laughs> some, some of these I've seen. Um, Ask if you are um, subject to the, the reporting requirements of 
that are that are imposed on sexual predators and things like that, and then they kick you out if you are. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there are other kinds of. I mean, you identified some reasons that are that are impermissible. I'm doing this to hide from my bank mm -hmm. or whatever, or from my predators. Right? Um, but the sexual predator thing, I think, is usually a statutory requirement limit on the right to change your mind. Isn't it? You, you're talking about this, huh? No. Hmm? No, no, it is. There's also like if you're a felon, it has to be like 10 years after you were convicted. So there are like a, a series of these. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that's... Maybe, maybe I'll take a look because I'm that. curious about that. I spoke with them a little bit and they did some research on there and didn't come back with anything. I think again, part of that as far as a, a very legal technical reason is that it's just a lot of common law. But I'll, I'll double back around on this. Yeah, the sexual predator thing is a national you know, registry and the, you yeah. know, you know, so I'm, I'm sure it's a federal requirement that you don't change your name to hyphen. Yeah, no, the that reporting makes sense. Reporting requirements. So. I'll see what the you know, interplay between the data is. Alrighty, thank you. Yeah.